parents have the resolution problems. Well, at this time, we're going to dismiss the children to Children's Church. Everyone who is eight years old and under can head on out to the Children's Church area where Miss Deborah is, is uh, waiting for you to share wonderful things. All right. She is ready to go this morning. Um, I have, over the last couple of months, gotten repeated messages and devotionals and sermons and uh, radio shows that have talked about change. That, you know, be ready for change. Be ready to go where God leads you to go. And I'll uh, tell you what, things like that scare the bejeebers out of me. Because <laughs> you never know what that means, right? And, uh, you know, Susie and I have talked about that repeatedly. And, and both her feeling and mine is that whatever that change is, it doesn't involve leaving here. And just so that you're... Uh, <laughs> a lot of pastors start their, their resignation sermons that way, I guess. Uh, but uh, we don't believe that that's the case. Um, and uh, I don't know if this was the, the point of these messages, these devotionals and sermons and Bible studies or whatever that I got, but... Um, last week I preached, started preaching a sermon on distractions, right? And we were talking about there were three distractions, but I only got through the first one. And that was legalism. Remember that? And, uh, which is very unusual for me to only get through the first page of the sermon. Very unusual. Uh, well, on the other side of that, uh, there's a, a young man in our Church who was given a book by someone outside of our church called Pagan Christianity. And uh, it had really disturbed this young man. And so I asked him if I could have the book to read and that I would give it back to the owner when I was done with it. So uh, he, he gave me the book in December. And I was busy writing a, a paper to try to get it published in a journal, um, and didn't finish that until last Monday, sent the paper off on Monday. So I thought, I'll just start reading this book on Tuesday. And so I started reading the book, and I was so upset into the, the, the middle of the first chapter that I, I couldn't read anymore. Couldn't read anymore. And I, you know, I... I don't normally get that upset. Grant seen me that upset once. <laughs> but I don't normally get that upset by reading something. And so I was, um, uh, I, I put it down, I just left it, and I came back, and I, I was praying about what, what am I so upset about about this? I mean, what are these people saying that is so upsetting? And as I prayed and thought, it, it, it dawned on me that what I think upsets me so much about what these people are saying is that it's legalism. It's a new form of legalism. You know, the, the legalism of the New Testament was more about following the law, you know, doing these things to be godly. Uh, but specifically this book, Pagan Christianity, I believe is fostering a new kind of legalism on the church today. I'm not going to tell you who the authors are. If you want to find out who the authors are, you can Google it and find out who they are. Um, so as, as I'm reading this book, I realize that this subject, legalism, is exactly where my sermon ended on Sunday. So I thought, well, maybe God is saying that I needed to talk about the book and to just bring out some of the things that it says that, that uh, I think are problems. And the thing of it is, is that I don't believe in the 20 some odd years I've been in ministry. And I forget how old I am. I thought I was turning 49 this year. Susie reminded me that I'm turning 50. And, uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciated that. <laughs> yep. uh, 
I look it. So, uh, but no, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Where was he going? Some odd years. Thank you. In the 20 some odd years that I've been in ministry, I don't believe I've ever done that. Talked about a book from the pulpit. Uh, because I don't believe that my job as pastor is to talk about books. My job as pastor is to talk about the Bible. Amen. And it's not my job to say what the Bible doesn't say. It's my job to say what the Bible does say. So this is this is new. This is uh, I, I'm, I'm going out on a limb. This is a change in the way that I'm doing ministry. And hopefully this is all of the messages that I've been getting over the last few months about change. This is it, and I'll be good. <laughs> I really don't like change. So the, uh, the sermon today is we're going to look at this book, Pagan Christianity, and, and I'm going to present to you why I believe that this is legalism today. Okay. Um, now, you don't have the book, and I don't want any of you to buy the book. I don't want anybody, anybody to check it out at the library. I don't want you to go to Goodwill, because it says in the book that if you don't like this book, give it to good, Goodwill. So no one ever go to Goodwill ever again. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't buy the book at Goodwill. Okay? Uh, what I've done is, in that first half of the first chapter, which is like seven or eight pages, I came up with nine pages of objections. All right? And so during the week, I've been trying to distill down what I've, I, my responses to the, to the things that I objected to and the things that I objected to, just a few of the things. Okay, so it's, like, it's only four pages now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this on our website, the full thing the full uh, review of the first half of the first chapter of the book. Okay, I'm not going to read the rest of the book. I'm not going to read any more of the book unless it's to provide the citations for the quotes that I'm using. And that's what I've tried to do is quote the book so that uh, I'm not misrepresenting what the authors are saying. Okay? Are you with me? This is, this is different. It's unusual. Dan's got a scowl on his face. What in the world is he doing? Uh, <laughs> I think this is what God wants me to do. And uh, John said I could. So, if you have a problem, I John. I can handle it. Okay. So, you have a certain outline, sermon outline sheet, and there are no fill in the blanks because I don't want anyone to have to go home and not know what this is about. Okay. Um, there are premises for these teachings that contradict the Bible, and specifically the teachings of the book Pagan Christianity. I believe that there are teachings in the book of premises of the book of pagan Christianity that contradict the Bible. Now, there are two major premises that they operate from. And in talking to the person who gave the book to this person in our church, uh, they these were the main two points of their argument when we were having a conversation, argument, about uh, the, what the book taught. So these are the two premises that the book is based on. First, they say that the first century church was pure. And I'm quoting the book. It says, I believe the first century church was the church in its purest form before it was tainted or corrupted. That's not to say the church didn't have problems. Okay, so the first premise of this book is that the New Testament church was pure. Oh, that really echoed. And my question is, have these people ever read the New Testament. I just, just while I was at the doctor with Seth for an eye doctor's appointment, just wrote down, went through the New Testament and wrote down the problems that the New Testament church had. Okay? This whole page is listed with problems that the New Testament, and this isn't all the problems, okay? I'm just going to read you as many as I can without boring you. All right. The, the Jer Jerusalem church. The where the church started. You know that by the time Paul came back to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, it was so controlled by legalistic Jews that the, the leadership of the church was afraid of Paul's presence. And so they made him pay for the 
the the vow, the Nazarite vow that these that four of their members had taken to pay for the sacrifices. And this was no small Paul was a missionary. It's like it's like inviting a missionary to your to your church and, and having him, him take you out to dinner. I mean, did you ever do that, Randy? No. Never. Randy would take in an instant, right? You'd never let a missionary pay for his dinner. They made Paul, this missionary who had who had devoted his whole whole life to sharing the gospel without cost to the people of the world, pay for these other guys to fulfill their vows. Where do you think that money came from? It came from the pockets of the churches that were sending him money. The Jerusalem church was so controlled by these legalistic Jews that the leadership was afraid of Paul coming to them. In Antioch, there was division there. Division that was involved the Apostle Peter. In Rome, the Gentile Christians felt they were superior to Jewish Christians. They were still conformed to the world, according to uh, Romans 12. They weren't submitting to the government, Romans 13. They were judging each other's spiritual maturity, in verse, Romans 14. They had spiritual pride, Romans 15. There was this disunity, Romans 15. And there was division in their church. Would you go there? <laughs> Who would want to, right? Corinth, oh my word, two whole books written about the problems in their church. I mean, uh, there were divisions, there was legalism, there was, they were suing each other, there was sexual sin that was be totally just uncontrolled and unresponded to. And there was, I mean, it was just a horrible church. The church in Galatia, they deserted Christ to follow the law. They received a different gospel. They allowed sin to go unchecked in their body. They didn't deal with sin correctly, and they weren't supporting the church staff financially. Now, if it isn't the church staff that he's talking about that they weren't supporting financially, who was it? In Ephesus, they had people who were teaching false doctrines, according to 1 Timothy 1. There were Judaizers who were part of their church in uh, chapter 6. Uh, there was immodesty. There were domineering women. Not that there aren't any domineering men. I'm just saying that that was a particular issue that he raised. Okay? They used to, they used to there was greed, and they had lost their first love, according to Revelation chapter 2. Philippi, they received Judaizers. They followed false teachers. They had major unresolved conflict. Sound like any church you have ever been here in, in, in today, right? The church of Colossae. Their doctrine was being corrupted by Gnosticism, which is special knowledge. Rationalism by arguments and human thinking. It was being affected by legalism, by asceticism. That's uh, buffeting your body. It's, it's self-punishment. They had undealt with sexual immorality and relational conflict in their church. Thessalonica. They questioned Paul's sincerity. There was sexual immorality. There was false teaching about the, uh, the dead in Christ and the day of the Lord. This is a problem Paul had to address twice in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. They were disrespecting their leaders. They were freeloaders in the church. And again, another problem that had to be dealt with twice. In the church in Crete, the church was full of rebels, mere talkers and deceivers. They allowed Judaizers to go into people's homes and ruin whole families. There was greediness. They disrespected their rulers. They engaged in foolish controversies and they were divisive. The elect lady. Now, we don't know the name of the church. I don't know that it was the elect, elect lady Bible church in Ephesus or whatever. Um, but this was the book that uh, the Apostle John wrote 2nd and 3rd John to. This is the church he wrote those two books to. They welcomed deceivers and allowed them to teach false doctrines. And by 3rd John, Diotrephes, the pastor, had led the church to reject the Apostle John and run out anyone who followed his leadership. This is one of the last books that was written in the New Testament. So on and so forth, okay? And I don't, I, I didn't even look at the, 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 the book of Hebrews, which is written to churches in general, and all the problems that that, that author points out. I didn't look at James and all, because again, it was just written to everybody, and all the problems he listed there. And the first and second Peter, I didn't list any of the problems there. Was the church in the New Testament pure? <laughs> don't be Not ridiculous. Quite. It was as bad as any church I've been to today. Pergamum, the church, or, let's see. The per church at Sardis was a dead church. Have you ever been to a dead church? Oh, yeah. How is that pure? The church in the New Testament was not pure. It was just as broken as it is today. Go figure. Why? Hold on a second. Let's 
people. So one is that they say the first the New Testament church was pure, right? uh, which I wholeheartedly disagree with, and I think the scripture gives evidence to the fact that it is not true. And then two, they equate Judaism with paganism. This is what they say, that the desire to have buildings is not a Christian practice, but comes from other religions, primarily Judaism and paganism. Judaism is not equal to paganism. There's no connection. There's no similarity. Yes, they have the same practices, okay? They had temples, they had uh, priests, they made sacrifices, but it isn't that those things were wrong. It's not wrong to have a temple. It's not wrong to have priests. It's not wrong to do sacrifices if you do it to the right God, right? This is what, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible in the Old Testament says that God gave us the law. God gave the law. He gave the rules. He gave the commands. He told uh, Moses to build a tabernacle. He, he told Solomon to build a temple when he built the temple. God came down and dwelt physically in the temple, in the cloud, the Shekinah glory. This is what Paul says about the Old Testament, the law. In Romans 3.31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? Is the, is the law void because you get saved by faith and not through the law? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Because it's the law that shows us that we are sinners, that we have sinned and we are deserve punishment, and that God is holy and just, and tells us what his standards are. Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Romans 7, 12, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Romans 8, 3, and 4 tells us why the law didn't work. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why didn't the law work? Because we sin. Human beings sin. All human beings sin, right? Is that what the Bible says? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? So it's because human beings sin that the law doesn't work. If we could not sin, could we keep the law? Yeah, yeah, that's what Jesus did. Jesus could not sin. Jesus did not sin, and so he could keep the law. If we could not sin, if we did not sin, we could keep the law too. But the fact is that we can't not sin. Double negative, I know it's not good. We sin. The same reason the law didn't work for the Jews is the reason why the church doesn't work for us as Christians. But we have a difference in that we have the Holy Spirit who is constantly renewing the church. He's, he's coming in and moving and bringing people to, to Christ and, and helping people grow in their faith. And yeah, it's, it's always a cycle. The church gets more godly and then it gets less godly. And it's just always been the, the case and it will always be the case. It's not that you we should let the church as it is today die and restart it with New Christians, that the problem is the system. And it's just like the Old Testament, the problem was not the system, it was the people. The problem is not the system, it's the people. So when you restart the church, when you reanimate this dead body that you're, you're making alive again, guess what? Who's going to be there? People. That's people who what? Sin. 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 No matter how godly we think we are, no matter how godly we want to be, we are going to continue to sin. And I, I'm going to be... I pray, this is my prayer, that I continue to grow in my faith until I die. I hope that's your prayer too, that I can continue to grow in my faith, that I don't mess up my life so badly that it will never be what God had hoped, it, desired it could be, right? It's living God's dream. I want to live God's dream my whole life. Amen. Right? And so then, my godliness will be transfer to my grandchildren's life and they'll become even more godly than I was because they'll start where I left off. Is that the way it works? No. no. We all have to start at the same place as sinners who come to Christ and we all have to start with, with the godliness, the journey of godliness. That's what's wrong with the church is that it doesn't transfer. 
my godliness doesn't go to the person after me or the person after them. I didn't get my godliness from the person before me. My godliness started when I trusted in Christ's forgiveness, and then it will go until it ends, and then the next person will have the same opportunity. That's all it is, is an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. So in 100 years, when I'm 150... <laughs> no, I'm not going to be 150. Who would want to be 100? Anyways, Jeez. when I'm gone, somebody else will have to, to learn the things that I'm learning now. You know what I'm saying? So the church will never come to the place where it doesn't struggle with sin. That, that it isn't corrupted, it isn't broken. And it was broken in the beginning, it's broken now, it will be broken until Jesus Christ comes back. But the Holy Spirit is constantly renewing it and making it so that it won't die. It Amen. can't die. Thank you, Lord. Because of the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. All right. Number two. There are things they say, the Bible says, that it doesn't say. In the book. All right? And these are quotes. They say this, the Jewish system of the temple priests and sacrifices was ended by Jesus. That's a direct quote. The temple, the priesthood, and sacrifices were ended by Jesus. The Bible says that there's going to be a third temple. There was the first temple, which was the one built by Solomon. The second temple, which is the one was built by Ezra. And there's going to be a third temple. Now, Jesus refers to this third temple in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the Antichrist, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Where is the holy place? The temple. In the temple. right? So the Antichrist is going to set up the abomination of desolation in the holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant was, in the temple. The temple, what temple? The temple that's going to be rebuilt, that's going to be used during the tribulation. And then in Zechariah 14, specifically verses 16 through 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations after the tribulation, going into the millennium, I believe in the tribulation in the millennium, because the Bible talks about those things, right? And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. In verse 20 it says, In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judea shall be holiness to the Lord. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day there shall be no longer a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. What's going on in the millennium? Temple. They're worshiping in the temple. So if Jesus ended the temple and sacrifice, then what's it doing in the millennium? Hmm. Do, you, do you see my point or am I just reaching for straws? Okay. Next. They say, the early Christians also did away with sacrifices. The only sacrifices they offered were the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. All right. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says that Paul and other first century Christians offered the sacrifices associated with the Nazarite vow. Okay? The Nazarite vow was an Old Testament uh, part of the law where you could make a vow that you would not cut your hair. Some of the teenagers I know would love that vow. I'm not going to cut my hair for this length of time. And then when the vow is over, you shaved your head. That's that's the that's the drawback of the whole deal. Because you've got to shave your head after. Right? And then you take your hair to the temple and you offer it with a whole bunch of offerings. There's you have to offer a sacrifice of a male lamb in its first year. You have to uh, offer a ewe lamb in its first year. And then a ram as a peace offering. You have to bring a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and grain offerings and drink offerings. You had to, in order to fulfill your vow, you had to bring all of this stuff to the temple, right? 
And what did they do with that? They didn't bring the lamb home and raise it and, and call it Bobby or, or whatever. <laughs> they sacrificed it. Where did they sacrifice it? At the temple, okay? Or the tabernacle in this context, but then they did it in the temple when the temple was built. So in Acts chapter 18, it says in verse 18, and Paul, after uh, this, tarried there yet a good while. He was somewhere, I can't remember where. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed from there to Syria, and with him went Priscilla and Aquila, <laughs> having shaved his head in Sincrea, for he had made a vow. What vow? A Nazarite vow. And so he was on his way, he stopped in Ephesus, and he was sitting in the synagogue, and, and he was on his way to Jerusalem, what? To fulfill his vow. What did that require? Sacrifices. He had to, he, I mean, it couldn't, he couldn't bring his hair to the temple and say, oh, by the way, I'm a Christian, so I don't have to do the lamb thing and the, the ram thing and the goat thing and the, 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 all of this stuff. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm exempt because I'm a Christian. No, he did what was required according to the law. He offered sacrifices. And then when Paul came back to Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 21, again, there were believers there who, were, who had taken a Nazarite vow and were fulfilling their vow, and so they wanted Paul to pay for that so that uh, everybody would know that Paul was a good Jewish boy, right? He followed the law. Out of his own pocket, he had to pay for this. And this was not cheap. You know, it's not like it used to be, where you could go and you could bring your lamb and your ewe and, and all of the stuff, and it was acceptable. You had to, it was like when Jesus cleared out the temple of the money changers, you had to buy your sacrifices there. So instead of bringing sacrifices, you had to bring money. You had to pay the temple tax, and you had to take, pay all the, the current rates and exchange rates, and, and they used the money that you gave to buy the animals that they had to sacrifice. So is it true that the New Testament Christians did not offer sacrifices? No, it is not true. They did offer sacrifices. Now, when did that end? Well, it ended at 70 AD when Titus came in and destroyed the temple, Right? as well as most of the rest of Jerusalem. That's when it ended. But it wasn't because the New Testament Christians realized that sacrificing was no longer acceptable. It was the destruction of the temple. And again, in the millennium, are they going to sacrifice? Yes, they're going to offer sacrifices. Now, do we offer sacrifices? Do we cut the heads off of chickens? Funny rabbits? No. We don't do that. Okay? But it isn't because it's wrong. It's just not necessary, first of all, and it's not a part of what we do. All right. Next. They say, when Jesus told the Jews that if they destroyed the temple, he would raise it in three days. He was not talking about the building. He was talking about the church. And what they're saying is that the, the church is the new temple, the body, the, the congregation of the Lord, not the building. It's the people. Are the temple. Is that true? Are we, the body of Christ, the temple of God? Yes. Am I, Tracy Brian McConnell, the temple of God? Yes. But Jesus isn't talking about the church or me. He's talking about something else. Let's read what Jesus says in John 2, 18 through 22. He says, so then, oh, pardon me. He says, so the Jews answered and said to him, after Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Is Jesus talking about the church in this passage. What's he talking about? It says it right there. His body, you know, the one that was put on the cross and rose again the third day, which is what the passage is talking about. So they say that this, this scripture reference is talking about the church. It's not talking about the church. It's talking about the physical body of Jesus Christ. So they say things that the scripture says... But what they're saying, it says, aren't, isn't true. Their statements about what the scripture's saying is not true. 
It clearly contradicts what the Bible is saying. Finally, three, number three, there are things they say are wrong that the Bible presents as acceptable. They say burning incense is wrong, along with candles. If you burn incense or candles in your church, it's a pagan practice, and you should not do that. Unfortunately, the Bible, not unfortunately, fortunately, the Bible says God made the burning of incense a part of worship. In Exodus 30, verse 1, it says, You shall make an altar to burn incense on. Now, why would they make an altar to burn incense on if burning <coughs> incense was wrong? They were burning incense. They had special ingredients that the incense had to be made of. So is burning incense in worship wrong? No, it's not. They say having clergy is wrong. You know what a clergy is, right? It's an ordained minister, somebody who has been tested and, and validated that this person is qualified to be a leader in the church. But the Bible says that God placed leaders in the church to oversee and care for it. In Acts 14.23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church, they prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. In Acts 20, verse 17, in 28, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And verse 28 says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Titus 1, 5 through 9 talks about how elders have to be qualified and have to be tested and have to know the word of God and have to be godly. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 talk about how Jesus gave the church apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3 says that, uh, that we are under shepherds and that we are to shepherd the flock that God has called us to. And Hebrews 13, 17 says that there are people who rule in the church that should be respected. So if it's wrong to have leaders, ordained people who have been set aside for this specific goal because to shepherd the flock because they are godly, they know the word of God, why does the Bible talk so much about what their qualifications are, what their responsibilities are, and what their, our obligations are to them. They say communion without a meal is wrong because then it is only a stylized ceremony. So you have to have a full meal when you're at a meal. And we've done that. When we first started as a church, we did that. Do you remember that? We used to have a potluck on communion Sunday, every communion Sunday, and then we would have communion within the potluck dinner. And it got kind of creepy. <laughs> it, got, it got kind of like an afterthought. It wasn't a big deal anymore. It was just kind of a, a ritual. Does anybody know where communion comes from? The Passover, the Last Supper, which is the Passover. What is the Passover? A stylized ceremony, right? Isn't it? To, to remember the Passover, the Passover of the, the Lamb? of uh, the, the blood of the lamb on the, the, the doorpost so that the death angel would pass over them. So is there anything wrong with us having a stylized ceremony to remember what God has done for us? No. That's what they did in the Old Testament. Why can't we do it now in the New Testament? And if their meal, their meal they're talking about, isn't the Passover meal, then it isn't legitimate. It isn't valid because that was the meal that communion was instituted with. The two elements that we drink were, I think it's the, the bread and the third cup. There are a series of cups that you drink through the, through the Passover meal. And, and so unless you do the whole Passover meal, you're not having communion. Is that the way it is? Is that what God wants? No. No. I don't like that Here. They say having a platform is wrong. That's one area in which we are a godly church. We have no platform. <laughs> Praise the Lord. At least we're not totally reprobate. But the Bible says that Ezra used a platform in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 4 3. It says, So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him at his right hand stood a whole bunch of guys, and on his left stood a whole bunch of the guys. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So is it wrong to have a platform? It's, it's ridiculous. 
These are ridiculous rules that they're turn. These are ridiculous things that they're pulling out of what we do to church and paganizing them. When, if if it was okay for those people to do it, why is it wrong now? When it never says anywhere. Have you ever read "Thou shalt not have a platform in thy service"? <laughs> My observation. The premises for the beliefs of the authors who wrote pagan Christianity are that the first century church was pure and that Judaism is no better than paganism. These premises are the basis for the belief that everything the New Testament church did was right and everything they didn't do is wrong. So if our church owns a building, and this is different from what you've got there because I can read it. If our church owns a building, has an ordained minister, uses incense or candles, celebrates communion apart from the meal, has acquired a platform, chairs on a platform, a pulpit, pews, a cross, a steeple, or a sermon every week, then our church is practicing pagan Christianity. That's what they're saying. Unfortunately, neither one of their premises are consistent with what the Bible says, from my point of view. None of the standards they are measuring other Christians with are clearly set in the Bible. There's no verse that says, Thou shalt not use candles. Thou shalt not have a cross on thy pulpit. That, they, that thou shalt not have. <laughs> Nowhere does Jesus or Paul or John say you shall not have a building or a church or call it a church or have a pulpit. The problem is that they're raising their standards above God's. What is that? Legalism. Legalism. Paul says, so let no one judge you on food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. In other words... The, the, the Christians were practicing some of the, the law. They, were, they had brought some of that into their worship. And it was okay that you brought some of the Judaism, the, the, the law into Christianity. It's not, as long as it's not you know, the, the sacrifice part of, of paying for our sins. That's not something that we need to worry about. But everything else support, apparently was free game. Just like we saw last week, legalism keeps us from living God's dream because when I refuse to associate with people because they don't measure up to my standards, I lose out on the opportunity to live out the dream God has for me to impact their lives. And that's the problem is that people who read this book see us as ungodly. They see us as ungodly. They don't, we don't measure up to their standards. And because we don't measure up to their standards, what are they going to do? They're going to disassociate themselves with us because they're more godly than we are. Listen, I'm not all that godly, and neither are you. But that's normal, right? That's the way it is in the Christian life. The problem with the book is, this book is that it's legalistic. At first I thought it was heretical. I think I told the guy when I talked to him, I think my first impression about the book is that it's heresy. Well, I changed my opinion. It's not heresy, it's legalism. It's making out godliness from human standards. If you want a deeper relationship with Christ, that's awesome. But it's not the system that's keeping it, you from it. It's your own heart. It's our own hearts. It's our own sin that are, that's keeping us from it. And I'm, I'm duking it out against sin every day. Sometimes I take a shot to the jaw, and I'm on the floor. But I get up. Because Christ is in me. The hope of glory. And, and he's given me... Uh, greater is he that is in you than he's, uh, he that is in the world. And, and I am the victor through Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't have to have a perfect church to be, become more godly. It's not up to the perfect church. Now, is church important? It's essential. According to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, you cannot become as godly as you could be without the church. They never s cited that passage in the book that I, the first eight pages that I read. We can become more godly. And in and, and our church, we have opportunities for that. We have the Growing in Christ seminar. That's going to be March 14th, 15th. If you haven't been to it, you need to come to it. It's on the website. If, if someone's looking on the internet and they, they, they want what we use in our church to become more godly, that's what we use. Go to the growinginchrist.org website. Click on, uh, uh, that's not it. It's youcangrow.org. Youcangrow.org. And it's the Growing in Christ book. It's, it's a Bible study, and you can use that. And, and then there's the Growing in Love Bible study, which is in a couple of weeks, where you can learn how to imitate God. 
pretty impressive opportunity for us. Personally, I think there are offenses being committed by the, the people who wrote this book. Uh, they have wounded people in our church, and they are wounding people all over the world. And so, I feel it is appropriate at this point to pray the prayer of release for what they've done. So we're going to pray the prayer of release. Now, if you're not familiar with the prayer of release, it's a prayer written by Dr. Gary Chapman that is uh, based on the concept of an imprecatory prayer where we're giving the offenses that have been committed to us, against us, to God. So we're going to pray a prayer of release for these guys right here. God, you know what the authors of this book have done in creating a standard of godliness that is worldly and human and elevating it above yours, Lord. You know the, the damage it's doing to the Christians who read it, to the young and, and searching Christians who need your body to grow. You know the, the emotional harm and the spiritual harm that it's doing, Lord. So we give you the anger, the, the offense, and the pain of what these men have done and are continuing to do. Lord, you say in your word that we should not avenge ourselves. So we give you the anger and the offense and the pain of what they're doing. You take care of them. Do what needs to be done. Thank you, God, for taking the anger, the offense, and the pain of what these men have done. And I pray that you would allow this not to bother us or to control us or to consume us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.